Hello and welcome to this recap of today's CodeBuddies.org live coding session. CodeBuddies is a global community of amazing people who help each other become better at software development through conversations on Slack and peer-to-peer -peer organized study groups and virtual hangouts. Today we're continuing working on the Western Friend website. Western Friend is the official publication of Quakers in Pacific, North Pacific, and Intermountain yearly meetings. It's a very big geographic area in the Western United States and Northern Mexico. Western Friend has been published for around maybe 10 years, 10 to 20 years, I'm not sure. The online archive goes back uh, almost 10 years for Western Friend itself, but the deep archive, when it was known as Friends Bulletin, goes back to 1929. So today I've been working on building out the deep archive section of the Western Friend website, putting some more or less little polish final touches on there, but also changing the data model. Uh, so the data is organized a little bit better and to improve the user experience for the content manager. So without further ado, let's take a look at the changes. From the last week's session where we had stopped uh, having just rendered the PDF and sort of struggling with the table of contents, uh, today we were able to finish out this table of contents table, literally a bootstrap table. Now the thing is, each of these rows has an action on there that when you click the button, for example, it'll actually turn the row, the, uh, the PDF to the corresponding page, which you see that is page 1000, that was just a little experiment. There are two numbers here I'll show you real quick relating to pages. One is the page that the JavaScript uses to turn the page, which uses zero-based indexing for the PDF. And the other is the print page number, which this example doesn't have a, a page number here in the and the corner of the pages uh, anywhere. It's an older issue, but some of the later ones do. So let's go ahead and take a look at this from the editor's experience. And actually I wanted to edit this page. So you edit the page by adding a title, a unique identifier for the internet archive item, uh, some other metadata, and the publication date. Then we start building out the table of contents. Today I switched out what well, was a sort of convoluted model using nested um, tables basically. It's not nested literally, but having foreign key relationships across two tables and nesting them in the user interface using inline panels. It was a mess. It just didn't work out. It was pushing Wagtail to the limits. There's a known bug. Wagtail will support that um, feature at some un uh, unknown at this point in time, uh, point in time. <laughs> so in other words, they have, they know that there's an issue when you have nested in line, um, models. And I think they know the source of the issue and what needs to improve, but it's not on the roadmap saying, well, we'll have it at the next release. Okay. So I was like, what can we do in the meantime? Well, we don't want to have our whole project be blocked by this really bad user experience and you know, the priorities of the Wagtail project may be different. And again, it was an edge case, so I don't really um, hold any hard feelings about that. But they actually, Wagtail comes with another really excellent uh, aspect, which we haven't been using at all, called the stream field. And what the stream field does is it lets you add a, uh, it's a field that you can add blocks, like different types of widgets, um, headings, pictures, videos, um, pull quotes, you name it. And you can actually define your own custom blocks. And you just add those blocks one after the other. So what I've done here is for our purposes, we need just a, a tailor fit block and only one type of block to be allowed here. And I call that block an article. I'll show you how that's defined in the code. Now each article, this is populating a table, table of contents, has a title, one or more authors, so you can add multiple authors and look at that user interface. I didn't write any of that code. It just works out of the box. And then a page number. Let's get this back down to a reasonable <laughs> number. And then, yeah, we just publish and view live. And you can see I just made the change. If I would have added an author there, they would have appeared as well, comma delimited. 
So that's how the end user sees it, both from the reader perspective and the content manager perspective. Let's take just a few minutes and look at the code and keep this recap rather short. Uh, I'm just going to go alphabetically in my pull request. It might not be the most cohesive way of approaching these. Typically, I start from the model when I'm defining these, the content model. But in any case, let's just try this out and I'll change it. So we're, we're displaying these things in the bootstrap table. So we just add some bootstrap classes there so it's nice and tight. It doesn't take up too much space. It's striped so it makes it easy on your eyes. Um, the button's a little big, but that's about the smallest I could get the button. We define the table headers. You know, just We're not localizing text in this project. We could though. And then for each of the articles in the table of contents for the page, and we'll look at the data model in a moment, we're going to display a table row. And notice that this table row has some data attached to it, the page number in the PDF and the in your archive identifier. That's actually used by the JavaScript to do the page turny thingy. <laughs> but uh, we won't delve into that too much. Uh, I, I suppose, why not? When you turn the page, it gets the page number and fixes, avoids off by one or fixes it to zero base indexing. Uh, and then gets the Internet Archive identifier. And it's actually replacing the iframe source um, with the, a new URL. And somehow, and, uh, so you get the, it constructs the new source and then you set it, the source attribute to that new source. And somehow the Internet Archive um, knows that it should render a page flip animation instead of just like kind of blinking in uh, a new uh, iframe. It's pretty cool. I'm, I'm really impressed by that. Pretty fortuitous. Uh, so, yep, that's a quick glance at our JavaScript, although I didn't write that today. I wrote that in the last session. It's kind of interesting. Um, so for each of those articles, we're rendering a row. You can click anywhere on the row in the event. So if I hop back to the front page real quick, you know, I can click, uh, maybe it's not working actually. Uh, let me double check what's going on there. If I just refresh it, uh, it could be my network also. There it goes, I can click anywhere in the row, but we do have this button to signify and to call people's attention to say, hey, you can click here, otherwise it wasn't obvious. Oops, all right. So essentially, yeah, we just render a button in that row and the, each of the data cells is the article. Now for stream fields, you have to, um, it took me a little bit to figure this out, but you were iterating over this stream field, which is like a list, if you recall, from the edit this page diagram. It's like a, a list and you can append more of them to the top or bottom. You can change the order of them. And so each of these items has all these properties, all that data there. And sorry for my video cutting off the bottom part of there. Uh, but I think there's nothing you're really missing here. You see the page numbers. Yeah, in any case, when we're displaying those in the template, we just have to get those values out of there. It wasn't quite obvious. I thought I could just say article title. Uh, it took me a while reading the documentation very closely to notice that. Um, so I can display the title directly from the article, but for the authors, we actually need to iterate over those. So there's a little loop there to display the author string version, which just returns the uh, author title, which is first and last name concatenated. And a little bit of a thing, a little trick, I guess, or magic, or just uh, we want those authors to be separated by commas, except when there's only one author, then there shouldn't be a comma there, or the comma shouldn't tra um, trail the last one. So uh, Django being batteries included has an if not for loop last. So when you're looping inside of your for loop, you can see if you're in the last item. And if it's not the last item, we'll just put a comma there. So it makes things nice and easy to follow. I didn't check whether I need to add a white space here. We'll just come to that later. And then again, we're displaying the table of contents page number, which can differ from the PDF page number. All right, cool. So let's check out the model. On a granular level, we have this block that we're repeating over and over. And so to do that, we uh, back to lets you dis, um, define custom blocks here. And we're creating what's called a struct block, which is a structure consisting of multiple fields. Uh, so our fields for this archive article block are title and authors, which is a list of authors. Each of those authors gives us a page chooser because in our data model, we have this uh, couple of tables, page types for people, organizations, and meetings. And potentially any of those types of um, entities 
could have authored an article. Uh, I'm just allowing any page to be chosen, but I believe I should be able to narrow down the allowed values here. I just thought of that. Uh, so in any case, we got a list of authors, one or more of those, and you can see that uh, each of these is rendering a corresponding field. When I choose a page here, it gives me this modal dialog. All of this is done by Wagtail. Uh, I didn't write any of that. If I like search for Mary is our only uh, author, I know the only person I've added to the thing, but I could add her twice. Now you see, and I can change the ordering. I say, well, actually, Mary was the primary author, but anyway, that's a bad example because we could just have Mary and Mary. You can edit the page. Huh, it's pretty handy. Okay, cool. I'm trying to keep this short. Sorry, <laughs> but I just keep getting sidetracked by wagtail awesomeness. And then we just have those two fields that are integers for the page numbers. Uh, and then meta, you can just say, well, what should the icon look like? I think, um, where is that actually rendered? Right up here, <laughs> doc full. So it's an article, just, it's a nice little touch. We put icons everywhere else. Uh, kind of helps you give you a little bit of landmark, visual landmark. All right, cool. There's only one other main file, so we're almost done here. Um, so we changed our, um, I think it was called archive issue model to now have a stream field. So we just have to manage our imports here. And if we wanted a page chooser. I think we already used that. There's some linting changes, but if we come down here, I think most of that's lint. So removed on the left-hand side, all these old nested, we had an archive article, an archive article author, all of these things. And it was just um, a lot of code and it didn't really work and it didn't look good in the user interface. I, I, it worked in that the user interface rendered things and the data would be stored there. Um, yeah, it's just a lot of lines of code. And we were able to reduce that all down to one stream field panel by defining a table of contents field as a stream field consisting of articles. And each of those articles is represented by an archive article block, which you have seen defined over here in my archive article block. So pretty elegant. I think the code stays fairly compact and clean. And I don't know if this uses an extra database table or how it's stored behind the scenes. This is my first time working really with the stream field, but really enjoyed it. Um, and one change to the base HTML uh, was just to add font awesome icon CSS so that we could render when viewing it. Oh, interesting. That's, that was a shortcut. See if I, or maybe if I hop back. Uh, basically, we wanted to render the little button. These are font awesome icons. Um, I'm not going to show you the base HTML because the whole thing is highlighted. Uh, my linter got it. I've enabled auto linting and there was a lot of indentation changes, I think. So the whole file is lit up blue saying all of these lines are changed. Well, that was about it. It was about a one hour session, an hour and 15 minutes. So and it looks like we have a 15 minute recap video. I tried to keep it brief, but there's a little couple digressions got on. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Again, this has been a CodeBuddies.org live coding session recap. If you want to get involved with an active community and maybe even start contributing to an open source project, check us out on GitHub, github.com slash CodeBuddies. We're rewriting the CodeBuddies.org platform. It's fully open source. We're writing it in Django and a couple of other technologies to see how they compare and to find, choose a final solution um, based on the developer experience and the number of contributors and other factors like that. So if you've got a favorite technology for web development, come on by and let us know and you can get involved if we're already working with your favorite technology. All right, thanks again for watching and have a great day.